Thanks. Yeah, so uh, I'm Jacob, uh, I'm with Tezos. Uh, so uh, Tezos is a, a new uh, proof of stake uh, blockchain, uh, recently launched uh, the beta net um, in uh, early June. Uh, and uh, basically, or sorry, in early July. Uh, and basically the way, uh, you know, Tezos on-chain governance works is that uh, it allows the stakeholders to come to consensus, not just about, uh, you know, the state of the, you know, the state, but also about, you know, protocol upgrades. Uh, and so uh, protocol upgrades, you know, it's typically, you know, you want to change the transaction, uh, you know, if you want to change block size, if you want to change block time, these sorts of things. But it's also if you want to change the consensus mechanism itself, if you want to change the governance model itself, you can do all those things in Tezos. Uh, so uh, the way it works is, you know, there's sort of uh, several cycles uh, of voting. Uh, the first cycle is sort of like deciding on, a, you know, what uh, upgrade we want to to uh, move to, uh, and so then uh, that, that you have to meet a quorum of 60%, uh, and then it, uh, that goes to a test net, uh, and then from there, uh, it's uh, you know based on uh, a predefined amount of time, uh, it's then moved onto mainnet, uh, a, a new vote uh, to decide whether to move it onto mainnet, uh, and then that's another 60% of the quorum uh, amount uh, votes to approve it. Uh, so it, 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 at a minimum, it's about like 36% of the network uh, can approve uh, a protocol upgrade, uh, in, in, which is like pretty important in a decentralized network. Uh, you you know it's pretty hard to get people to coordinate. So, uh, but uh, the underlying sort of motivation for Tezos uh, is this idea that you know you want to keep the the network uh, decentralized and you want to make sure that governance is decentralized. But you also want to make sure that you're keeping a pace with innovation, right? And you also want to make sure that you can uh, maintain the network effects because, it, you know, at the end of the day, these things are money. Uh, at least at the core protocol level, they're, they're money. Uh, and uh, money's value comes in almost entirely from Metcalfe's law. So the, the idea is that, you know, you look at even things like Bitcoin or, or other protocols uh, that aren't necessarily keeping a pace with innovation, uh, but there's still so much value in it just because of the, the network effect that it can maintain. Uh, and so Tezos is trying to sort of like, okay, let's keep that network effect, let's stay decentralized, uh, but we also want to be able to, to keep a pace with innovation. Uh, and, 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 we, and we also implement, uh, you know, ways of sort of making it easier for people to evaluate the quality of proposals, uh, and as well as, uh, you know, sort of making it easy for people to easily audit uh, proposals. And uh, in the future, we want to move away from voting entirely. Well, we want to move away from rel entire reliance on, on voting. Uh, so we want to move towards a, a hybrid model uh, that uses both prediction markets and uh, and voting to approve, you know, the so, so the prediction market creates like, you know, this focal point that everyone sort of agrees everyone else will want to be on. Uh, and then uh, everyone would then vote to approve it as a check on, you know, whether or not it's actually a good idea because, you know, sometimes prediction markets can go awry as we've been seeing recently. Uh, but the, uh, the the end the end game is hopefully like, you know a project that is stays decentralized uh, you know at, at the governance level um, but also you know keeps pace with innovation. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, up next we have Adrian Brink from Cosmos. Hello, I'm Adrian. Nice to meet you. Uh, so I work on Cosmos. Cosmos, very quickly, I'll give you like a 30 second pitch, or like 30 second overview. It's building the internet of blockchains. So our thesis is that it's in the near future, it's all about having hundreds if not thousands of independent state machines that may or may not have shared or non-shared or so sovereign security models. So either they're all secured by the same validator set or some are secured by their own validator set. And the idea is how do we make them all interoperable, right? It, like that's the main, the coolest feature about, for example, Ethereum is that like everything just works with each other. And so our notion is how do we make multiple, in, how do we make it very easy to build multiple independent blockchains? And then also how do we enable multiple independent blockchains to connect with each other and talk to each other? So that's a protocol called IBC, Inter-Blockchain Communication. It's simply a notion of how do we pass authenticated data transfers or like or value it really doesn't matter in this context between independent consensus systems so we have blockchain a and we have blockchain b and ideally i want to be able as a user to send a message on blockchain a that locks up some tokens against the consensus set of blockchain b and that message then gets relayed and on blockchain b i know that given such a message, I will then receive money, the, like the token on blockchain B. Because this 
enables all sorts of cool applications. For example, instead of having to build a DEX on Ethereum where all the tokens are right now, you, and you have to build into the EVM, you can say, I really like Go, or I like Rust, or I like Haskell. You build your independent state machine in Go, Rust, or Haskell, and then you say, awesome, there are all these other tokens in like Bitcoin, Zcash, um, Ethereum, and now I can just connect, connect them all to my chain, and now, or to my DEX chain, and now the DEX has the full capabilities of building your own state machine, so you're not constricted to something like the EVM, and yet you still are able to interact with everyone else. So that's like sort of the quick overview. Internet of blockchains, it's all about interoperability. In order to make this work, we also need a fast finality consensus. So we, we've built something called Tenement Consensus, and an instantiation called Tenement Core, which, gives you inst which is a PBFT algorithm that gives you instant finality. So within, block, within a single block, you have finality, which is sort of a requirement. You need a finality consensus algorithm to make IBC work. In terms of our governance model, our governance model is very straightforward. It's, yes, it's just very straightforward. It's only bonded token holders get to vote. Uh, you have multiple vote types. You can vote yes, no, abstain, or no with veto. If more than a third vote no with veto, then it just uh, halts this single vote under the notion that if a third of your population really dislikes something, there's probably a point in not doing it and talking more about it. Like, you don't want votes to be coin flips, essentially. Like, where more than a third feels very strongly about not doing it. Um, besides that, it's simple majority governance, so it's like 51% to accept, to get a proposal accepted. And then the upgrade path, it's not happening on-chain because, like, so we were as cautious as possible. It's like, not on-chain, nothing automatic. People essentially vote on-chain, say we want to run this, like, we want to implement this feature, then someone builds it then we can all start upgrading our nodes eventually in the future. If we have another, maybe another governance vote on like when exactly we want to upgrade to this. Yeah, that's like, because we really don't know how governance will evolve, so we wanted to start simple. That's it, thank you. Yeah, and up next we have Igor from POA Network. Welcome. Hi guys, uh, my name is Igor, I'm from POA. Um, so POA is, um, um, is immediately available scalability solution for Ethereum ecosystem. Uh, so it's a side chain uh, based on a priority code base with a different uh, Sybil control mechanism, which uh, we call uh, proof of authority with uh, identity at stake. Um, so this is a, a public network um, uh, available uh, um, um, uh, since uh, December 2017, uh, and it's all built about, uh, it's all built uh, based on the uh, uh, governance model, uh, because when you start a uh, permissioned network uh, with, uh, um, uh, with a public consensus, uh, the, one of the main questions is, you know, who are your authorities, who are validators, how you uh, how validators added or removed from the network, um, how they selected, uh, and uh, how can independent uh, uh, token holders uh, uh, prove that this consensus is working as it's designed, right? So we have um, multiple steps to bootstrap this type of network. Uh, it all starts from a trusted ceremony, where a special role, which we call master of ceremonies, create first initial keys which cannot be used uh, for uh, anything but for, uh, only for uh, exchanging this key by, by individual validators to a new set of keys. Uh, and uh, this master of ceremonies distributes these keys to uh, validators with specific parameters. We decided to use validators as individuals, so, so they are all US-based uh, validators with uh, staked identities. So it means that they're all KYC. Uh, with no previous criminal record, uh, fingerprinted by their state, and uh, their identity is available on the website of state where they re reside. So we use some existing state level uh, um, uh, registration uh, of uh, individuals to achieve this type of um, confidence in, in individual validators. And after this um, uh, ceremony is uh, completed, uh, validators have uh, on-chain self-governance so they can add or remove validators from the network. 
Um, our concern was is it working or not, and, uh, and now we can see that uh, validators added um, uh, from 12 to 21 validators, and network continues to grow. And this model is uh, easily scalable both vertically, so validators can decide to increase uh, parameters of these nodes, and uh, horizontally, so they can uh, make um, uh, new networks based on the same consensus with a different set of validators. Um, and also we have uh, independent tools uh, where um, any concerned third party can, um, can check uh, how validators participate in ballots. Um, they can subscribe to governance events. Uh, and um, basically this uh, uh, creates the possibility to, to run this network. This network is two-way packed to Ethereum network used to modify uh, parity bridge. And um, uh, both uh, native and packed tokens are available on exchanges. So this is uh, uh, the first uh, two-way packed blockchain uh, in public space. And um, yeah, so it's all about uh, uh, governance. Without governance, it's not possible to create this type of model. And just like one last thing, um, in April 1st, post uh, by Vitalik, um, uh, on April's Fool's Day, two years ago, he said that uh, Ethereum mainnet is going to migrate to proof of authority consensus as a joke, right? And now we can see that this type of consensus uh, can operate in public space and uh, interesting to, to applications. And uh, we understand that there are better scalability solutions in future, but uh, not many uh, immediately available scalability solutions we have now. And POA one of these solutions. Thank you for your time. Hey, thank you. And up next, we have Gavin Wood from uh, Polkadot Network. Cheers, Phil. I'm just out of interest. Who already knows what Polkadot is? Do I need to give a, an intro to that? Put your hands up if you don't know what Polkadot is. Mm, too few. Ask me afterwards. OK, so um, the, uh, what I want to tell you about is um, uh, what sort of features we built in for governance and roughly how governance sort of we see it working. Uh, one second. Okay, cool. Right, now Polkadot's based around a, uh, a technology called WebAssembly. Who's heard of WebAssembly? Yeah, everybody, okay, cool. Um, WebAssembly is a very, very simple um, VM definition, basically, it's like, pfft, I don't know, 30 instructions. If you get rid of the floating point ones, it's like super duper simple, super duper basic, can be used for anything. People have done all sorts of crazy wacky shit in it, like um, uh, like 8-bit and 16-bit emulators. You can play them on the web, it's great. Um, we're gonna use it for um, describing how a blockchain works. So the Polkadot blockchain is actually based upon a lower level bit of technology called uh, Parity Substrate. Now Parity Substrate is basically just some networking to talk to other peers, some logic for synchronizing some code, um, some logic to form a consensus over which block should be considered the canonical, finalized, next block head of chain, um, and a WebAssembly interpreter. And the WebAssembly interpreter is there to say um, what the next block, um, um, uh, whether the next block is indeed valid or whether it's not valid. So actually, it only really defines one function. For those of you who are sort of into blockchain and architecture, um, it's the execute block function, right? So it's this kind of super low-level, all-encompassing function that basically says, um, here's a block. Tell me what the fuck it means, right? And that also means um, these are some transactions in the block. Tell me what they do. Um, now, this is kind of different to some of the other projects. So, for example, um, uh, with, um, uh, with Tezos, the idea is that the entire executable can be, can be moved out when the upgrade happens, when governance decides that, that something should change. Um, that's not the case with, with Substrate, with Polkadot. We're actually only changing the sort of the logic of the blockchain, the nature of the blockchain, the thing that changes, uh, the thing that, that makes Bitcoin and Ethereum different, right? They both have the same consensus mechanism. They're very similar peer, uh, peering mechanisms, but actually the key difference is what the transactions mean or the, the, the state transition function if you're into the technical part, uh, side. So we allow that to be changed because it's defined in WebAssembly. So then the question is, um, how can it be changed? Ah, damn it. Uh, let me get this back up again. Um, now, 
We believe in uh, uh, coin hodlers and empowering coin hodlers. So we have, um, if you, this is like a rough diagram of how things work. You see the coin hodlers at the bottom there, right? So these are kind of the polka dot uh, uh, token owners. And there are th basically two ways um, that new stuff can, can get into polka dot, that, that, the, um, uh, that polka dot can, can change and evolve and move with the times, which we think is, by the way, very, very important. Um, and one of them is that they can, um, uh, they can table a motion, they can, they can propose a motion. I propose that we change the blockchain from being the current Polkadot blockchain to this new, amazing, featuresome, awesome Polkadot blockchain. Great, fine. They're publicly proposed motions. They go into a queue, people can back, back them, they can throw extra dots behind them. And every now and again, every two weeks or so, the thing at the top of the queue, the thing with the most dots saying, hey, this is a good motion, I want it to, to, to come to pass, I want to see a referendum on it. That moves into the tabled motions and it becomes a referendum. People can vote on it. Now we have a voting mechanism that basically means it's kind of like majority carries, but we actually also uh, give a bonus to the minority if it's from, um, uh, from the coin hodlers, because we think, well, you know, unwashed masses, mm, might be some dodgy stuff coming in here. Um, so we, we force either a high turnout or um, we force the, uh, the, the positive votes, the I votes, the votes for change, to be substantially greater than the negative votes. The other way of getting um, a referendum in is via the council. The council is, a, um, is an elected body, um, elected through approval voting with a staggered seat. So basically every, every now and again, one seat comes up for, um, for vote. And there's a bunch of, every, all the coin holders can vote for it, and it's an approval vote, so that's not first past the post. You can choose as many of them as you want um, to vote for, and it's the one with the most aggregate votes. They get in. The runners-up get to keep their votes, which means it's really unlikely um, that, that uh, there won't be some degree of churn of different uh, people coming in as the uh, free seats go round in a circuit. Now, unlike some of the other projects, um, we actually believe that, um, you know, you've got to put your neck on the line. I mean, uh, this is, uh, we've done this a few times in the past. We haven't always been successful in it, but we still believe uh, that you can't play it safe with everything. And uh, Polkadot is, again, one of the uh, technologies where we're, we're willing to actually be the innovators in the space. And in this case, we do want to have um, absolutely binding on-chain governance. So Polkadot is actually a meta protocol. It's a protocol that governs how the real protocol, the protocol of Polkadot, changes over time. And this governance mechanism is part of that sort of protocol. And the meta protocol is a thing that's, uh, that kind of says, right, the governance mechanism has decided that the protocol needs to change. So we're going to change it. And that happens on-chain with consensus logic. There's no way of getting around it. You can't sort of, um, as a a, uh, as, a, as, a, as a miner or as a full node decide not to upgrade as you can in Ethereum or as you would be able to um, in the, the Cosmos take on things. This is very much more like the, um, like the Tezos worldview where it's like, no, um, you know, governance is on chain and it should be binding. The thing that happens on chain should be binding and we believe it should be too. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, we have Jack DeRose from Colony. Thanks very much. <laughs> hey, everyone. Um, I'm Jack, as you know, from, from Colony. And we are an Ethereum-based project building tools for the governance of decentralized organizations and applications. So um, I'll try and keep it really super brief so we can get into the panel where I think we'll get into some of the sort of juicier stuff. Um, so uh, we are building both a protocol and a, a sort of fully decentralized application, um, enabling both developers to um, build new kinds of decentralized organizations, de decentralized applications, um, and, and also for new organizations which are not necessarily starting off with the intention of being um, a sort of DAP-based thing to, to be created. So, so new types of DAOs new types of open organizations more generally. And um, so, so I suppose just to cut to the quick, we're, we're sort of contrarian in, in two important ways in comparison to the majority of other sort of decentralized governance approaches that you'll hear of. So the first is that we generally think that voting is, is, is a really bad idea and something that should be avoided wherever possible. 
Um, so, so in colony, if a vote is taking place, it's usually because either something's gone wrong and there needs to be a dispute over it, or something's extremely urgent and needs to be happening sort of relatively quickly. Um, the second is that if a vote is taking place, then the authority, the influence, should not be derived by wealth. So that generally token holding is a poor proxy for expertise. And so we have Colony's reputation system. And, uh, and a huge part of Colony, the, of the, the way it's designed, is entirely to sort of meritocratically um, apply uh, influence to individuals on the basis of the things that they've done, on the basis of the sort of empirical uh, evidence that what they have done in the context of a given organization has been of quality in the eyes of their peers. Um, and, and, and so we sort of permissively uh, assign influence to those people's decisions, uh, much in the same way as you would expect to happen in a sort of traditional organization. So it's trying to take the same principles of you know that we've we've derived over many many years of operating organizations at scale and thinking how can we decentralize those efficiently um, yeah so should we get into the panel yeah thanks it was really nice uh, hearing all the different perspectives some little Little competition uh, involved there. <laughs> um, yeah, we're, uh, if anyone's tweeting this, by the way, uh, hashtag is onchaingov. Um, sorry, <laughs> I was a little late with that one. Um, yeah, we're gonna have a panel uh, after we have a quick break to get some pizza that just arrived here. So uh, enjoy some pizza, and we'll be back here in about 15 minutes. Thanks. All right, let's get started. So welcome back. Um, yeah, I'd like to just maybe start off with um, one word that gets associated with uh, on-chain governance a lot is the, the term binding. And how is that, how necessary is that for your system, your model, and your vision for on-chain governance going forward? All, all of you. That mic's not working. Is that you may have to turn that on. <laughs> okay. Uh, really, really, really important. Can you can you go a little elaborate into that yeah, a, a okay. bit more? Um, okay. So the thing is, um, governance without a. a, a being bound by the result is, isn't really governance at all, right? So, for example, like Brexit, yeah? <laughs> now, you know, it's not, it's not my choice uh, to leave uh, the EU, but um, in some sense, it, it, it's a fair point by the, the Brexiteers that, you know, a referendum happened and the government really does need to, uh, to abide by it. Now, obviously, there are a lot of problems with the referendum, not least the fact that it didn't require a supermajority, because the, the change, um, change from the default should generally require a supermajority if full, town, full turnout isn't required. Uh, but if it were just a signaling mechanism to say, hey, government, we, you know, some of us would kind of like this. It's, like, it's too easy for the government to say, yeah, but you're mistaken. And the, the equivalent for that on the blockchain is, is basically the miners or the full nodes or the validators or whoever else basically saying, well, you know, we kind of hear you and maybe we'll do it at some point, but kind of basically we don't really care, you know. The other problem with no, it being non-binding is if it's non-binding, you don't, it, there's no impetus for the, uh, the proposal, for the, for the proposition that people are voting on to actually have any real detail. Until you know what it is that you're voting on, until it can be specified sufficiently well that it can be actually executed on automatically, then it's not really a proposal at all. It's just sort of a general vague direction. Um, and that's, again, a, a problem with Brexit and something that you know good governance really should so, uh, sort out. So 
my take on binding proposals is more like nothing is really binding. Like even if you have on-chain upgrades and everything, the people running the nodes can still coordinate off-chain and decide to run a different software. So even if you have automatic upgrades, there's always a way to unbind it. So there's like you will never get like full bindingness. Depending, on, it sort of depends a little bit on who in the how, who the community ends up supporting and who the la larger ecosystem ends up supporting. Um, I think having fully, like with binding comes also on-chain upgrades, and I think on-chain upgrades are risky. They are very cool, but they're also risky because you are essentially committing to running arbitrary, like anyone, any sort of software that gets proposed will end ends up being run. So, like in the worst case, you're building extremely large botnets if you have like automatic upgrades, and this is what almost happened to US that they had like a an execution flaw where they could have upgraded to something that that would have allowed people to circumvent governance and essentially force nodes to upgrade to a malicious software. Uh, so if I can answer those two points. <laughs> uh, on the first point, um, at least with Polkadot, it is possible to create actually binding upgrades. Um, because OK, I'll give you an example. All right, suppose. Suppose there's a you know 90% of, um, of voters decide to actually go with some particular upgrade path, some proposal. Um, now the full nodes, they or the validators, whoever, they they all get together and they say, well, you know, we don't like this. It's maybe it's reducing the reward or it's doing some other thing that sort of doesn't benefit them. So they say, right, well, we're not going to upgrade. So what do they do? Well, in principle, they can take the uh, state transition. You know, assuming that we have a binding system, they can take a state transition. Um, so they can take the block where this this thing actually changes things, and they you know they would be getting fewer rewards. It would be disadvantaging uh, disadvantaging them, and they can refuse to execute it. They can uh, they can change the result. They can say we don't want to do this, and we're going to do a different block. But because you have a binding protocol, because the, the protocol actually binds this result, what they're doing is they're hard forking. They're forking away from the default. Um, what that means is. Um, that they're creating a new network that the rest of the, 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 the people will basically disregard. They'll all get slashed and the rest of the people will carry on in the network that actually upholds the decision. Now, suppose, well, you say, well, they're the rich people, so they can just buy all of the other guy's stake and they can take over the network and they can attack it and then everyone will ultimately come on to, to the one that didn't actually push the upgrade. Well, the problem with that is that they're, um, that only works if, um, if they actually basically reduce the balance of all of the actual stakeholders. Because all that will happen is those stakeholders will vote again for the equivalent proposal on the new forked network with their same balances. And it will pass again with their same balances. And so they're forever, they're forever going to be fighting the will of the majority of the stakeholders. Um, on the second point, <laughs> actually, remind me what the second point was. I have no idea. Yeah. Second point. Um, what was the second point? <laughs> oh, b botnets. Ah, botnets. Yeah. So the botnets, the botnets is a is a reasonable um, point. So back in the Ethereum days, we had this thing called the uh, the Yellow Paper Council. What the Yellow Paper Council was was basically a contract on chain whereby um, it, it imposed some sort of governance. Now, the Parity Ethereum client uses this contract in order to decide whether it should upgrade itself. So the Parity Ethereum client's auto-upgrade mechanism actually is, is chain-based. So there's a governance mechanism that basically allows um, uh, automatically um, changing protocols. And the hard fork, there's all sorts of things to do with hard forks and soft forks, and it's got all sorts of interesting safeguards. But you're absolutely right. Um, if someone got hold of the keys or somehow forced in an upgrade, that would be um, detrimental to the network that perhaps injected um, an upgrade of parity of Ethereum that uh, you know, turned it into a big botnet, um, it would be a big problem, which is why for Polkadot we don't do absolute auto-upgrades. We don't do software upgrades. We only upgrade the protocol component itself, which exists only within a WebAssembly interpreter, and thus avoid um, uh, creating botnets just as sure as Ethereum smart contracts can't, um, can't, can't you know, fuck around with your host machine. Well, maybe botnets is the wrong word then, but uh, if this ever fails, it allows anyone to change any balance, right? Like, they may not be able to compromise the host, but they absolutely are able to compromise the network automatically. 
Yes. Oh my God, this is scary. The the old Ethereum clients had this. Tezos has the same, right? But still sandboxed. It, 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 yeah, so it, it, it's a pretty similar architecture in that that regard. But I, I was going to make another comment about uh, uh, you know this bind this this matter of binding uh, commitments in general, which is that you know if we sort of the vision you know especially with Tezos specifically, but it also sounds like you know even you know Polkadot and other projects are, are thinking this way is that it's like we kind of want these these blockchains to be like autonomous institutions out there you know that are sort of like independent of any central human control. And the idea that there's like, if you think about like what non-binding uh, agreements sort of like, like who, like who do they benefit? They, they, that's like always what we should be asking. It's like the only the people who typically want there to be, uh, you know, like some kind of non-binding agreement are typically people who like believe that discretionary power is important for some critical reason. And there are arguments, you know, for discretionary power in, in a lot of contexts. But like, if it's if it's miners, if it's people who are like early, uh, you know, do, you know, uh, token holders. Uh, in a project, uh, you know, in, in a protocol, uh, if it's people who are, you know, on the, you know, sort of the the elite core dev team of, of a certain protocol that I won't name, uh, they they're very very focused on, you know, their roadmap or their their, you know, things that they've described discre in a discretionary way, and they want the space to work on these things on the timelines that they want to work on, uh, as you were you're mentioning. So, you know, you have these conversations, and it's like, well, you know, we, we we can just like kick the can down the road on solving this problem that you know people have had you know maybe there's hundreds of millions of dollars locked up but like we'll just like figure it out and like you know we'll figure out how to how to solve it uh, like this is not like like this, th these sorts of problems are like real problems of like commitment of of you know getting people to sort of coordinate credibly um, like they, they require you to like really set uh, a place where you're going to say like okay here is where we are go you know in the decentralized network here is where we are going to say the rules end and discretion begins uh, and, and 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 the question is like you know which you know, if you're building a protocol, uh, you know, whether or not you think you want to be on like certain some point in that trade off and, and the place that, you know, Tezos and Polkadot and other projects put is like, you know, Tezos puts it like pretty far on the extreme end of that, you know, that pushes the upgrades, you know, sort of automatically, right? Uh, and it sounds like in Polkadot it's sort of more a limited, uh, you know, a way of, uh, of implement executing it. But like at the end of the day, like, you know, you have then things on the other end, which is, uh, you know, like this extreme hard fork world where, you, you know, you, put, you take all these upgrades you want uh, to, to put, uh, you know, that, that could have been done incrementally, but instead you're doing them all at the same time in a hard fork. Um, that maybe something happens and then all of a sudden, you know, snarks happen six months later because, you know, you don't want to have to worry about, uh, you know, causing everyone to be, uh, you know, uh, you know, fail to uh, coordinate around, have a consensus failure and, and, and fail to, uh, you know, go with your hard fork. So the point is, like, there, there's probably should be a diversity of, uh, you know, places uh, that we draw that distinction in terms of rules versus discretion. But like right now, the distinction, the discre discretion is winning <laughs> to a, such a large extent that we definitely need like lots of experiments in, in pushing that uh, t further towards autonomous, uh, you know, sort of these autonomous networks. Um, yes, the, the initial question was like uh, describe in one word. Right, what is governance? Um, yeah, so for, for me and uh, for PO Network, uh, governance is, uh, is uh, something that uh, we make equal with consensus itself, right? Because when you think about uh, some abstract uh, things like blockchain, right, many people understand different things about um, on the same word, uh, the same with, uh, with, uh, with governance. For us, uh, it became a part of consensus. Without governance, we don't have it. Uh, and um, uh, I think that. Uh, that uh, when I when I uh, participated in this workshop and I, and I heard different um, uh, approaches to of different projects, I understand that uh, each project can get something out of it, right? And uh, that's great that we have this type of collaboration, and our internal governance can be uh, um, uh, can make we can make it better by adapting uh, uh, practices from from other projects. So, so I, th I think actually the the initial question was. <clears throat> To what extent is it important that decisions are, are binding in, in governance um, in, in, in these kind of systems? And you know, if if we want to create things which are uh, controlled by many people, which are commons uh, in, in some sense, um, then it is impossible for them to not be binding. It is it has to be binding. Otherwise, it's really not decentralized. That's right on. I think. Yep, I agree. Cool. Cool. <laughs>
Yeah, uh, and with that, uh, the whole, many governance models that are coming out with on-chain governance are very, very, very adaptable so the governance models themselves can, can change. And this is something, are there, in a world without constitutions, um, are there places where this can, can go way too far without it, with, say it could be destroying itself uh, by killing its own blockchain, or are there ways of safeguarding against these um, in forkless environments? Yeah, so, so Tezos is sort of a, one of the original projects sort of looked at this question of like, okay, so, you know, governance determines the rate of change of a blockchain uh, as improvement or it, or it affects the ability of it to maintain its network effect, okay? Uh, and then the second question is like, well, uh, long term, like maybe you can improve the rate, of, you know, you can improve the rate of change. But what's even cooler is if you can affect the rate of the rate of change and, and affect acceleration, right? You know, improve acceleration. Um, or improve the ability of the governance model to uh, improve network effects. Uh, and so the argument, uh, you know, that, that Tezos makes is that, you know, basically, like, eventually a lot of governance models become stuck. Or eventually, uh, actually, like, you end up with gaming of the governance model where the, the, you know, people over time, they start to look at this governance model and they're sort of like, like, oh, like, you know, I, we can, I can start slowly forming this coalition. Nobody's maybe even going to notice that we're sort of forming this, uh, you, know, uh, prefer, you know, space of preferences that is actually antithetical to the rest of the network. Um, and you, you, like, you slowly build this coalition that opposes a certain change that would actually even maybe be, you would benefit all token holders, but like, you know, in some way you're benefiting a smaller group or whatever. Um, so, so the answer there is, uh, you know, you need to find a way, two things. You need to probably find a way to evaluate governance decisions. And that's actually something I've been thinking about personally is, you know, what, what, what are some ways that go beyond price, that go beyond, uh, you know, market cap, all these sorts of like, you know, sort of more raw metrics and look at like, you know, like, what what are sort of some of the like like a like what like who are like who are the potential rent seekers and constantly keep a track you know a track of them uh, but also look at like you know are people happy with how the 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 protocol upgrade process went were they happy with, you know were developers happy with it were were uh, you know token holders happy with it were validators happy with it like you want to you you want to be able to see if all these key groups are actually aligned uh, in supporting the upgrade because you know if you're doing things that for example maybe you're just starting to burn tokens or you're you know, you're doing something that maybe it pumps the price, but it doesn't necessarily make it a more valuable technology. And then in the long term, you end up hurting the same metric, very same metric that maybe was helping someone in the short term or something. Um, so, so things like that, uh, I think we need to think about, like, wh what does it look like for us to have good governance at all? Uh, and then also, OK, how can we change, imp constantly try to improve the rules, uh, the rule set, so that uh, people who might be trying to game it, like, are, you know, at a disadvantage. And so Tezos wants to move to Futarki. We don't think that you know something like in Futarchy is where you use prediction markets to uh, sort of have people have you know the, you know the decentralized network bet on uh, you know you're basically creating a market in uh, predicting uh, which protocol upgrade or which decision uh, would be one that you know enhances the, the metric that you've determined beforehand. So uh, in, in blockchain protocols, the easiest one is always price, uh, but there's also other things you could use like like transaction throughput. Or things that are like pretty like you know, and that's sort of like maybe a little harder to disagree on because you can run on a test net. But there's like other things that maybe like are you know welfare metrics, things that that you could even create a, ba a basket of or something like that that you could you could run a prediction market on. So uh, that's something that needs to be done carefully. Uh, it's not something we rush into, uh, but it's something that we think at Tezos is something that you can we can use to uh, augment what we can currently do with voting and really. Di, you know, sort of discourage gaming of the system because it costs money to vote against, uh, you know, to 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 uh, to say something, you know, to 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 uh, to uh, say something that a, a you know about a protocol. It's like, well, why about a protocol upgrade? Like, why didn't you, you know, make a lot of money shorting it on the the prediction market? Uh, could you remind us of of the question again? <laughs> How do you protect? protect these adaptable governance systems from getting out of hand and doing uh, maybe potentially destructive things to themselves? I think fundamentally you can't. Like, governance is scary as hell. Like, governance is powerful, but scary at the same time. You 
by giving a community governance, a decentralized governance system that no one controls, you give the community full autonomy over the choices they want to make. If those choices are detrimental to them, that's not great, but that's the choice they've made. Like the nice thing is that in these blockchain systems, we can always, in the worst case, you can like sort of restart. But fundamentally, I think with governance, we have to understand that giving governance a decentralized set of people is immensely powerful. And because these people can, theoretically, they don't even, they're not constrained to making choices on the protocol itself or how the protocol evolves. They can decide to make choices on whatever they want. They can make choices on whether they should all move to one country, whether they should all stop buying a single product. Um, and the nice thing is, it's like, the community is very clearly delimited, delimited, so you know exactly who's in the community. And I think this will create very powerful systems, but at the same time, very scary systems. Yeah, so I mean, uh, it seems unlikely that you're going to get a blockchain that will enforce people's decision to all move to. That's also it's Rico, true, it's uh, unlikely, but it's possible. That's but, uh, yeah. <laughs> Move to Puerto Rico by <laughs> Wednesday the yeah. 29th, or we will send the boys around to knock your knees in. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. But uh, it's, fair, it's a fair point that, that you know, governance is pretty scary. Um, and it's a problem that hasn't been solved, right? So, you know, we look around the world and we, don't, we see many different governance systems because we don't know what the fuck one is actually good. Um, they're all broken in, in different ways, usually. Um, now, what you can do is you can, you can introduce checks and balances, so you can like, you know, build on the shoulders of giants. You can have separate um, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, houses or subsets of actors whose job it is to, make, to keep the other subsets in line. Um, blockchains, indeed, uh, really important point, um, do have a rewind button. <laughs> You know, that's great. You know, many, many computer systems do not have that. Blockchains do. And that, that helps, you know, get out of jail free card when yeah, everything goes fucked. fucked. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think, I think beyond that, it, it's, it's something that is going to need a lot of experimentation. Um, so it's, it's worth keeping in mind a lot of these um, defense mechanisms. It's worth putting in the defense mechanisms. And it's worth basically being open to saying, well, we're not going to find out what is a stable system until we've made a few errors and rewind it a bit. And, and, and we have some basic uh, uh, rule sets, uh, some basic ideas about um, what doesn't get, uh, what is stable, what doesn't get broken really fast. So when you've got when you've got a protocol which is being um, managed by its users or its uh, the people its stakeholders in, in in some sense, and they you know they they are the custodians they are the developers almost um, of of itself it starts to look quite a lot like a company with a product, and you know most companies fail most companies have you know failures in the decisions that they make that cause them to go out of business. So I, I don't think there's any possible way to make a protocol immune from that happening. I, th I, th I think there's an inordinate amount of time and effort goes in when trying to design these protocols, um, given that you are generally trying to make them trustless, to prevent there being obvious ways for people to uh, you know, exploit other people, obviously. that's a terrible, terrible thing to, to have happen. You always try and avoid that. But there is such a wide attack space when you're looking at a high degree of subjectivity being involved in decisions that can be made, that it seems like it's very difficult to avoid it entirely. So I think that the a way to try and get to a position where we kind of get through this very sort of early period of understanding what on-chain governance even means is to have very robust ways of, of sort of, you know, big red buttons basically to say, holy shit, this has gone wrong. Let's, um, let's try and fix that as quickly as possible. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that there will be a lot of those kind of approaches which will be very beneficial. 
Um, so uh, in PO network, we when we design it uh, on chain governance, we try to make it uh, as casual as possible for for people who participate in this governance. So, uh, for example, uh, uh, we limited uh, uh, who can participate in this governance uh, in PoA. Uh, it's only uh, uh, validators can do this, right? And uh, their tools are uh, built for 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 them, right? So they're uh, UX and UI friendly, uh, and also they have um, a governance process uh, um, like every every single week, right? So they have to decide uh, on validators on both on testnet and mainnet. Um, and um, they most most of them vote in new validators, uh, and uh, well, and sometimes they vote out uh, validators who are um, not following rules. Uh, so this process is casual, and um, uh, it's kind of it's, it's hard to to break uh, because it's um, it's uh, it's something that they are doing um, uh, you know, on purpose and uh, eventually for for uh, uh, for the for the good of the network. But there are some. Uh, 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 there is a upgradability of this process, so validators can vote by supermajority to change uh, uh, rules of this on-chain governance. So, for example, they can introduce a new form of uh, uh, voting. Um, uh, in, uh, in in POA, uh, we uh, we described uh, a model for self-sustainability. We think that you know most uh, projects who raise funds on ICO eventually will run out of these funds, right? And after they will run out of uh, tokens they pre-mined. So, what 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 to do next? Uh, we decided to embed a self-sustainability mission into the protocol, and from the second year of the network, the network will create additional tokens, and these tokens will be accumulated for a, uh, for three months, and uh, and after validators can decide how to spend on which R&D team to to spend these uh, resources, or you know burn these resources, or hold them for three more months. Um, this model exists in EOS, in, in Dash in some form, and, and some other blockchains. Um, uh, and uh, for validators, that will be an extreme form of governance, right? First of all, they need to make a hard fork to activate this, and, uh, and after to make some uh, new type of governance when they can basically break the network, right? Or make a major a failure for, uh, for R&D team. And um, so that, that's why they, they have like two processes. One is like... Every every week they vote in or vote out for validators on test and, and, and mainnet and, and something extreme and they prepare for this extreme governance events. So that's 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 how we how we decided. Yeah, so I'd just like to follow up with <clears throat> while binding on chain governance um, is certainly the wide unknown to which we, you know we've yet to figure out. Um, it's worth remembering that the alternative <laughs> is off-chain governance, <laughs> which hasn't proven to be all that great so far. Um, and I think in much the same way that when Bitcoin came along, the alternative to a fully autonomous, decentralized um, financial system was the existing meat space financial system. <laughs> you know, some of us thought maybe it was worth a fucking jump in the dark, you know? Um, and the second point is, well, it's, it may be, off-chain off -chain governance is not so, there's not all that much to distinguish it from the difference between um, sort of off-chain smart contracts when Ethereum came around. So back in like early 2014, when you know, we're still trying to get people around to the idea of smart contracts, uh, everyone was like completely into Bitcoin. The, 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 the biggest sort of thing I heard against the idea of Ethereum was, well, yeah, this hasn't been tried before and it's so much more powerful. What are you gonna do to stop you know, everything just going wrong? And it seems to be a little bit of the same point with on-chain governance, with binding on-chain governance. It's like, this is, this is like so powerful. You're introducing kind of a, a meta protocol and then what we would normally have that's fixed and looked after by the core devs can be changed kind of in a decentralized manner by, you know, the great hand from the sky. It's like, well, yeah, but, you know, that's kind of why we're in this space. You know, we, we kind of trust that if we put the right rules in place, then the great hand from the sky will generally make the right decisions. Yeah, and um, speaking of off-chain governance, some of its proponents have often associated another word with on-chain governance uh, called plutocracy. And uh, this is something that just always comes up from anyone arguing in 
against on-chain governance, for, and it's heavily associated with it. Do you do you think it's it's valid this association, and and if so, um, how are how are you uh, fighting against that? I, I, my response whenever, whenever people say that is like I ask them like, do you know how much money Bitmain la made last year? <laughs> like, do you know do you know how much you know Vitalik and all these folks had like like in Joe Lubin like whoever it's like th this is not like rule by like peasants here like this is like you know an oligarchy or so you could even call it, like an oligarchy like, these are people who are in early and they like you know they control you know the the net you know this the future of the network um, and the model is actually not that like, like like it has its problems and it's hard to for them to move to you know maybe an on chain governance model but I I feel like the the irony I've I've always observed here is that like exactly what Gavin is saying is that these are people who are like some of the best mechanism designers in the world. They have some of the best like understanding of trade-offs like in the world. And whenever you say like, oh, well, we think of it in terms of trade-offs and experimentation, they say like, oh, plutocracy. It's like, no, like it's, it's a trade-off. Like we're trying to figure out like, you know, if this experiment uh, gives us a better side, whether that trade-off is worth it. And like th th this is like this great, like I, I think we're going to see uh, something, re you know, some really interesting uh, responses if this works, because they're going to say, I, I guess the next reply will be, well, it could turn, it could degrade into a plutocracy uh, pretty easily or something like it's, 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 I think it's going to get watered down because these on-chain governance models are actually going to be pretty stable, probably, at least a lot of, some of them, one of them will be at least relatively stable for the, for the first, you know, few upgrades potentially. And, you know, there could be a situation where the sort of the next, it's just sort of going to be the next, like, moving the goalpost, but like, what's the next thing that you want to, you know, sort of like point out about? Well, it could still, it's still a plutocracy, like, I don't know, it, it doesn't seem, uh, it, it's, it doesn't seem like a sustainable uh, approach to on-chain governance, you know, if you're running an off-chain governance uh, project, uh, govern project. I mean, it, it won't descend into plutocracy. It, 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 it will be from the... Uh, is it back? Yeah. It will be from the outset, right? So the question is, is whether that is... You know, because, you know, the, the, the plutocratic approach is a response to the, the, the civil problem that you can't... It's very hard to do something democratically because it's so trivial to create multiple identities. And even if you do have identities, it's pretty hard to ensure that people are only controlling one identity and they haven't bribed other people or bought them or coerced them in some way. So, I mean, even that actually applies with, um, with, with, with state-based voting as well, to be honest. But so, so the question is whether with a plutocracy is the only alternative, and and I, I don't think it is. I think you know we, we have reputation-based um, decision making within Colony, which it does come from having received tokens, but it doesn't necessarily have to come from having purchased tokens. So it doesn't need to come from having had wealth in the beginning. And I think that there's, you know, the, the rationale behind that is is that really wealth is no proxy for expertise. And it's and depending on the granularity of the decisions that are being made within the context of a protocol or organization, it, it sort of determines the extent to which this is, um, is an issue. Uh, if you're making relatively large scale decisions relatively infrequently, uh, which are, you know, uh, broadly ratifying decisions that have already been made by people who are spending a lot of time thinking about these things, um, then it's probably not too bad. It's probably a perfectly reasonable way of, of, of governing a, a, a protocol. But if the kinds of decisions that are being made are far more granular, uh, and in fact the governance of, of the protocol or organization that's trying to take place is more of a sort of operational basis or a sort of managerial nature, than the sort of, um, I suppose, shareholder voting equivalent that we might uh, expect of, of, of many um, uh, uh, protocol level um, governance processes, then I think it's far less clear that it's reasonable to weight people's decisions by how much money they had or have or, yeah. And that's our fundamental position. Uh, so, can you hear me? Yeah. Almost all democracies, almost all, are not very democratic. And there's a reason why. It's because the actual theoretical model of a democracy 
does not deliver a particularly nice place to live. So if you look at all the, the governance of tribes, they're not based around one head, one vote. They're based around elders. If you look at the UK, even in its like democratic state at the moment, it's still not tremendously democratic. We have a first past the post for 600 odd constituencies, and it's those guys that supposedly make the decision until of course there's a referendum with a minority turnout. Even ancient Greece was not a one head, one vote place, right? And this is usually the, the typical place that's pointed out for a democracy that works. Um, you had to be fairly minted. All of the slaves automatically didn't count. All the women automatically didn't count. Um, we, we don't have... Better? Yeah. We don't, we don't actually know what delivers a great society in terms of um, the governance mechanism, in terms of who gets to make the decisions. But one of the fallbacks that we have is, you know, corporate governance, which is basically where the people that have the most to lose get to make the bigger, the t the bigger decisions, right? And they kind of get to vote on it depending on how much they have to lose with it. And that's not a bad fallback position. Now, we can do a lot better than it, I'm sure, but one head, one vote is not a great place to start. Something else is, especially if the thing that they're meant to be deciding upon isn't a society, it's not somewhere, it's not like a village where everyone has to live, right? It's an economic system. It's a system that's designed, you know, in some sense to be a currency, to be valuable, to have security. <laughs> Um, we have relatively simple metrics for deciding how secure something is. Um, and if one head, one vote says, well, I'm not so keen on security, but actually I would kind of like it to be, um, to give everyone some basic income or to do some other thing that's actually detrimental to the existence of the network itself, then you have a big problem. And that is probably, I would venture, you can, uh, you can uh, disregard my opinion, but I would, I would venture that's why certain societies that did give the one head, one vote method a try may not have succeeded so well. Um, yeah, um, uh, so um, I like sidechains, right? Uh, sidechains, uh, usually they're a small network and uh, it's easier to experiment uh, than on you know, big, uh, you know, uh, big networks uh, or big ideas. Um, you know, when we designed POA network, we uh, we decided that um, um, security will cost 2.5 percent uh, of uh, of uh, initial supply. We just uh, uh, figure out uh, uh, inflation in the U.S. and uh, and uh, give this inflation within the network to a group of validators, um, and um, and uh, they protect the network and uh, they they make all um, on-chain um, decisions and they they create only 2.5 percent of emission per year. So it's car it's hard to, to call them oligarchs, right? Because uh, uh, most liquidity owned by by token holders. And when we started to think, okay, how can we expand and experiment with uh, side chains even further? How we can create uh, uh, like uh, uh, if you know model of hard spoons, when you can create a new side chain and use uh, part of emission of, of existing chain uh, as an emission of this new new side chain. We figure out that uh, it's possible to create uh, very small shards with uh, you know like. Uh, order of uh, you know hundreds of thousands of dollars per chain uh, of uh, uh, market cap where it's still uh, interesting for validators to participate in this network and after we figure out that uh, there are models where validators will validate chain and support it even though they will not get any reward so even though this will be um, uh, not uh, not profitable for them. They will they will support this network because there are other economic incentives. For example, they can get some transaction fees from this network without uh, getting uh, any any coins created. And I think that um, you know new small networks um, uh, within uh, um, like ecosystem of Ethereum or Polkadot or Cosmos can can bring new economic models. And um, and we will see that okay, there are some networks operated by. And, uh, and will be more than that. So it came over. <laughs> <laughs> and will be. Yeah, oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, for sure will be networks uh, where we will see more democratic um, approaches and, um, and interesting models with. Um, with a zero emission or negative uh, um, negative emission, and uh, this this model is viable, and uh, we we can see it on, on on our example, and we see that people are building same models. Yeah. Um, oh, this works again. Great. Um, I, I think there are certainly problems 
with uh, the one head one vote one vote method. Um, but like on the other side, I think that there will also be problems with the like capital essentially rules the world because like I I try to reason like think about right like in Germany like a certain amount of money in your bank account translates into a certain amount of political influence essentially in the U.S. That amount of influence for the same amount of money is likely going to be much, much greater. Um, and in purely stake weighted systems, that is essentially a one to one mapping. Um, and so, like, personally, I think that, um, for example, the German governance system is doing reasonably w better than the American governance system. Um, so, I think, I, I think my main point is there will be a spectrum of things, uh, and the entire point of the coming probably two to four years is to experiment with every possible governance system because by building the underlying tools, we make it extremely easy for people and very cheap to experiment with different governance structures and different governance models. And hopefully, we arrive at something that is better than the current systems that we have. Right on, nice. Um, Okay. Does anybody want to ask a question to the panel? Questions. Yeah, questions from the audience. Um, hello, I'm Federico from Cosmos. Um, so one important concept in governance is the default values. So, um, so maybe you could define some default value for your uh, parameters change or for your software updates, for example. So how do you decide on each of your networks, the default parameters? Uh, you mean at launch, or when you do a governance proposal, there will be default default values? Um, yeah, I mean, like for example, yeah, in, the, in, in Cosmos case, on launch, but in, in others, uh, that not necessarily applies. Yeah, I mean, so the way you, I think the goal for how you want to pick these values is like pick reasonable defaults, like pick nothing that like tends to the either extreme, like pick something that you think is going to be stable enough for like six months so that within the next six months people can experiment and figure out whether they, those values are actually not that stable and they need to be changed or whether we can continue on with them. Like, you made this point earlier that you think that governance systems will be very stable. Uh, I think we've never, for a while, uh, I, my perspective is it will take a while for governance, it will take a long while for governance systems to start being stable because there's a lot of untested things we don't know about them yet and it's going to be very exciting to test them all out. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, for Polkadot, um, I, you know, I thought of exactly this, like even as far as, not just the default values, but even as far as the default governance system, like what governance system does it even start with? Um, and the answer is, well, let's, let's do like an alpha and a beta, right? So let's, let's not like bet the farm on the very first version, because <laughs> that's, that's a bit silly. But the problem is that if you don't bet something on it, you're not going to get a, an effective indication of how it will work when you do bet the farm on it. So um, we came up with an idea of like a value-bearing test net, which is kind of like a test net, except the tokens on it are kind of cheap but still have value. And the idea with this is that we can run this for like six months or 12 months just to see what kind of governance systems work, how people behave when real money is at stake, um, what sort of parameters work. Is a two-week referendum um, uh, period reasonable? Four weeks, one week, three days? We don't know, but let's try and let's see how many people turn out to vote. Um, also vote to turn out. Also, you know, there's a, there's a council, you know, is, is, is there there's this idea of like a congress, an overseeing congress, is that, is that a thing? Does anyone actually want to be a part of it? Is anyone going to put any, any effort into advertising their candidacy? We don't know. And it's worth actually figuring that out on a, on a network that is worth something, but just not very much. Uh, yeah, so so in Tezos, um, the way it was decided, so so we launched with a beta net, so we intentionally set a lot of the, the constants like pretty uh, conservatively. So 
uh, and, and this is one of the cool things about doing things, you know, having a modular design, which is that you can set the, you know, the parameters uh, pretty conservatively and then incrementally change them, uh, you know, and, and, and then later on in the governance model, you know, we'll have to, you know, figure out how to get a lot of people to pass the quorum to do things super incrementally. But uh, in the initial term, so we don't have governance for six months, uh, the core devs uh, from the original team, they're uh, basically, they set the block time at one minute, uh, but we've already talked, you know, there's been lots of talk already internally, you know, like, you know, looking at different testing of like different block time that's significantly lower than that, different blocks, you know, uh, size, like all sorts of things like this. Uh, and, and the plan is to, you know, start in a way that does not disrupt the, you know, the instability, you know, it doesn't cause the, the network to become unstable or, you know, to have a lot of empty blocks or anything like that, right? Uh, but then another interesting dimension that we, we've encountered is that um, there's certain constants that you create that might be very susceptible to, uh, like the the uh, voters uh, trying to change. So, for example, uh, bonds like our security deposits and safety deposits in Tezos. Uh, so, in Tezos proof of stake, you uh, in order to uh, you know bake a block, we call we call staking baking in uh, in, in Tezos. Uh, what well, we we call the block block creation uh, baking because uh, uh, it's a French project, <laughs> uh, and uh, basically. We set the security deposits that you need, like in, you know, similar to the Ethereum uh, slasher model or, or these sorts of thing. You know, you have to put up a, a security deposit that can be slashed if you uh, start baking uh, blocks on a second chain. Explicitly try to, you know, start start uh, uh, double signing blocks or double baking blocks. Um, and basically, uh, what happens? Uh, what, what we, one of the things we thought about is the fact that, like, if we set it too high, then like people who want to become validators uh, will, you know, maybe they'll uh, want to, if it, you know, sort of influence the bond size uh, so that they can, you know, participate more in stake in, in baking and like get bigger rewards or something like that. So we intentionally set it so so our, you know, it was intentionally set at a, a level where uh, it would be less susceptible to. Our, our, it was you know sort of modeled and thought out uh, and. and and you sort of set it at an initial level that would be uh, sort of uh, be able to avoid uh, uh, you know sort of some kind of manipulation that would undermine the security of the network long term. So perhaps hopefully more uh, again off. Um, so I think that you know using best judgment, you know how, how are you going to define these values? guess, more or less, <laughs> right? Try and come up with something that you think is reasonable. Try and make sure nobody else that is knows something about what it is you're trying to do thinks it's ridiculous. And, but not overthink it too much, because it's probably going to be wrong whatever you decide. So you know, that's where it's important to have the ability to change it when you actually have some more real data about what it ought to be. Um, I think too much effort can go into thinking about what the specific should be up front. Yeah, I think uh, these parameters are most uh, about um, uh, off-chain governance and protocol design. So the best way is define them uh, when you design the protocol, and it's hard to change, right? Especially sensitive parameter is the emission rate, so it, it's hard to you know increase it. Uh, and um, well, for for me, um, like uh, some parameters, like okay, what is the ideal number of validators, right? And you ask people, and uh, you know, like 20, 25 something. You ask about block time; it's like three, five seconds, uh, and so forth. Uh, but some some parameters are not obvious. For example, how many coins we should create on pre-mine? And when I ask it most founders, they just, okay, create a billion coins, right? Or 100 millions, and uh, they didn't have an answer. So like, uh, I just want to explain like, my thought process when I, when I decided uh, how many coins we should create for POA network. So we started from one block. One block, create one coin, right? And uh, in a year, it's about six million something coins if you have five seconds block time. And this is, two, this is a reward for validators. And reward for validators, 2.5% of uh, year emissions. So we know uh, emission, uh, uh, this uh, total supply, which is uh, 250 something million coins. That's how we figure out uh, pre-mine and think, start to think, oh, that's, that's a number. And we can explain why it's 250 million coins and not you know, billion coins. So that's, um, uh, and, and um, those parameters should be defined uh, uh, on specification the best way. So it's, it's a form of off-chain governance. But some parameters can be modified by on-chain governance. For example, if you decrease block time, but you have the same um, uh, emission
submission, which uh, you can make in last the latest version of Parity with a new functionality called block reward. You can define a reward uh, within smart contracts and uh, um, change uh, block time and uh, keep the same uh, emission rate. Um, so you can you can uh, upgrade the protocol. Like say, okay, guys, will uh, validators will upgrade their hardware. They will keep more data uh, on on chain data, but emission will stay the same uh, and the protocol will be better. And that can be decided by on chain governance. But some things like okay, let's increase emission because uh, price of token went down. Uh, this uh, type of decisions will be hard to make on chain. So that's, they should be designed uh, within the off chain process. Actually, just like uh, I just like to maybe like highlight this point. Like I totally want to second Gavin's point on this. Like running test nets is an amazing idea because it allows you to gather a ton of data on what the actual parameters are. And I think um, generally for most applications that you want to deploy, like you should find ways to be able to test them in as real of a setting as can be because it will teach you a lot about not only the process of deploying it, but also how they behave once they're deployed. Hey, um, we've talked about uh, one, uh, one person, one vote, and also like uh, the equivalent to uh, your money at stake. Um, how about reputation-based voting? Has anybody tested around with that? That is um, basically, uh, that's a, a huge part of Colony. It's, uh, it's all about uh, decisions being weighted, uh, or not so much decisions, but influence, authority over how things get done uh, is, is weighted by reputation. And that reputation is derived by having demonstrated that you have expertise in the context of that organization for whatever that skill is. Uh, and whatever the context within the organization is. So, yeah, that's, that's our thing. Yeah, yeah so in, uh, in Tezos, we haven't looked at that uh, really, but um, we, we were talking about it earlier today, and, I, and some aspects of it were pretty interesting for, you know, on the core protocol side. Um, we actually, you know, there's sort of an implicit reputation or, you know, way of evaluating, uh, you know, sort of trying to improve the quality of the decision maker set, like in, in Tezos. So we, in, in Tezos, you, the, the people who, the developers who propose an upgrade are able to invoice uh, the network uh, when they, and, and, you know, when they put the, the, uh, the proposal on a testnet. Um, they sort of say, oh, here's the invoice that I would want to be paid. Uh, this is what it would cost. Uh, if you promote it to mainnet, and maybe you have it as a vesting contract of some kind, and they get it over time, whatever. But if you think about what that does long term, it actually uh, causes you to, it causes the network to, when it inflates, it, so it does this with inflation, uh, it, what it's doing is it's actually creating a feedback loop that improves the quality of the, the, uh, you know, the decision maker set because it's in, like, uh, continuously uh, rewarding people who are improving the network. So this is something that, and also I think reputation systems are actually interesting to implement, especially on layer two. I'm, not, I'm a little more conservative about layer one, but uh, I, I think uh, I, I think that we should, when, when you're designing a governance system, you should think about like whether or not you're rewarding the right stakeholders with your, you know, if you're using some kind of budget or, or invoicing system, like how are you rewarding uh, people? You know, what's the feedback loop look like uh, when you when you move uh, tokens to to a given account uh, by inflation or whatnot? Yeah, so I mean, I, I, I probably agree with you that, you know, for layer one, reputation systems might be a bit overkill, and you do risk by implementing them there. I mean, they're relatively, you know, sort of complex, subtle things, and having them at that level is not necessarily, like, right next to the consensus and staking mechanism, not necessarily what you want. But it's also, I think it's a fair point that the reputation systems are not, like, tremendously well-defined. Um, there are many different ways that you might kind of determine that someone has some reputation. Maybe it's because they've got a lot of Twitter followers. Maybe it's because they've got a few Twitter followers, but those Twitter followers have a lot of Twitter followers. Maybe it's because they've um, been around in an ecosystem for a long time and generally uh, haven't done anything wrong. Um, 
It's uh, maybe they're just popularly known. Um, and if we sort of expand the idea of, well, people of well repute maybe get a bonus for their um, opinion, then you know we might be able to sort of um, introduce a really basic reputation system, which is that, hey, look, if they've been helping maintain this network, which we assume has been going reasonably well um, for a sufficiently long time, then we can consider them you know, people of relatively high reputation for this relatively low-level definition of, of reputation. And uh, that's definitely something that we're looking into with Polkadot. Uh, yeah, so uh, POA network is based on the uh, reputation of individual validators. Um, so we delegated this process to um, on state level. So all our validators required to have US public notary license, which uh, guarantee that they're not, they don't have criminal records in the past, and uh, they're publicly identified, and anyone can challenge their identity. So we used um, oracleized identity, which is a part of, um, uh, of, of the process of onboarding of new validators. And we think this is a great way uh, of reputation for people who basically hold uh, our funds, right, and make computations for us. So we uh, we know that they're not criminal, they're fingerprinted, KYC, and uh, they're in good standing with their state, and we know where they reside. Um, so it's a, it's a one form of reputation. And also, they're all in the same jurisdiction, which is a, which is also protect token holders from, from collusion of validators, because the US uh, punishment system is, you know, well known for uh, um, that it's working, right? Um, well, there are some uh, concerns about you know all validators in the same jurisdiction, and the jurisdiction in, is the U.S. But notary law regulated by state by state, and uh, there is no like federal uh, notary organization who can regulate them. And this is a this is one solution we can we can provide. Also, we build some. Uh, uh, Oracles to to prove independent part of their identity. So we have proof of uh, physical address where validators uh, oracleize their physical address, and then proof of bank account where they can log in into their bank account. And uh, this independent oracle can prove that they logged into their bank account, and this information or oracleized and also uh, uh, tokenized and uh, connected to their mining key. So you can prove that this validator. Um, past this uh, verification, also you can challenge him. You can ask, can you prove that you can log in into your bank account or that you can get this postcard in your mailbox, uh, which is the same mailbox as registered for you as a, as a notary. And when you register as a notary, you give OAuth, and if you lie, it's, it's a perjury. It's five years in, uh, in federal uh, prison in, in the US. So that's, uh, that's a way how we reuse the uh, existing uh, law system to guarantee reputation of validators of pure network. And that's very scalable because there are 3.5 million of public notaries in the US. Okay, uh, we are running out of time very quickly. So we have time for one more question. It would be great if we could have maybe just one or two uh, people uh, respond, if that's okay. <laughs> hey, so you mentioned just before that like you're going to test on-chain governance on test nets, um, but how can you actually guarantee that people will act in any way like they would in real life on a like non-value holding test net? Because those are these are really important decisions. Like, isn't it actually the yes. you need the you need something at stake for real for people to act correctly? To fully test the system, I agree that you need something at stake, which is why the having like low stakes test nets is potentially an extremely powerful way um, to actually, especially test things like on-chain governance and how the voting process works and whether people actually care about the system at all. I think to test what I was referring to was more like basic, more fundamental param parameters like block times slashing periods, downtime, require, like how long you can be offline before you come unbonded as a validator. More the parts related to the consensus and like maintaining a stable consensus system. And those, I believe that you don't necessarily need anything at stake because the early adopters that you have will, like there's a clear path to why this helps the future of the network to test this out when there's nothing at stake. And there's a lot of people that are motivated enough to participate, even if, there's, if it's just a testnet. But if you're planning to like, be an active participant in this ecosystem for the next two years, a lot of people have a lot of motivation to make sure that nothing gets launched that is fundamentally broken. So like testing these basic things, like block times, you don't need incentivized testnets, I think. Um, 
oh, uh, maybe for like actively attack, um, so like to test the security of other validators and like, uh, actually, so beyond even just simply having a valuable token, there's like other ways that the organizations that launch these networks um, can actually incentivize people. So like you can incentivize certain behavior. Um, there are all sorts of ways to get incentivized test nets. Yeah, just make the token worth something. Yeah, that I haven't heard of that before. That's actually a really cool idea. I like that a lot because for something like Colony, it's it's quite hard to uh, it's very questionable how valuable a test net really is because it's all based on sort of game theory. So the game theory really doesn't work if there's no value. So I heard of people actually buying Bitcoin test net bitcoins because they people started hoarding them. It's like, <laughs> oh, that happened, that definitely they, happened. They, they, yeah. Collector's item. Yeah. <laughs> what is a test net? Some people will buy There's an active market for Coven coins. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I, I heard people, someone paid like 10,000 uh, dot test net tokens for a pizza, actually. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the case our government systems are doing. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so uh, we, we embedded the participation and testnet into our uh, on-chain governance for validators. So one requirement to be a validator on core network is to participate as a validator on testnet for at least a month and participate for at least one governance event. So you have to add another validator or, or uh, remove validator from the network before you will be onboarded on the core network. So it's, um, it's a form of uh, onboarding process, like educational process. Yeah, I, I just have something quick to add. So uh, in, in Tezos, actually, the the, per, the protocol is written in a functional programming language. Uh, and functional programming really allows you to uh, do formal proofs very much more easily than um, you know different uh, other, other programming languages and uh, types. And you can, and one cool thing is that it, in, when you run a test net, uh, Tezos will, you know, eventually we're going to allow, make it very easy to do proofs of certain characteristics that, you know, within the test net. And so then, you know, you think about it like, oh, should we adopt this? Protocol? Protocol upgrade. Well, does it satisfy you know these uh, you know formally uh, formal uh, uh, characteristics that we want to you know be able to mathematically prove? And and uh, this we argue would create like a bigger shelling point around choosing that upgrade. You know because it would it would satisfy certain conditions that we we think are valuable. All right. I'd like to really. I'm sorry we're out of time, uh, but please we'll be hanging around here. Huge thanks to the panel for coming here. It was really great. Big thanks to Full Node and Web3 Foundation for hosting this. I'll see you guys around. Yeah.